Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Quentin Cobb, for those who don't know me, and I'm the events organiser and, and acting chair at the moment. Uh, tonight, uh, you will witness something that is really special, which is about the founding of this society of ours. I'm sure that many of you will have joined on the basis of, surprise, surprise, being an avid fan of George Orwell and his work. What I don't think you will have expected, which is what many of you have said in your feedback on the members survey earlier in the year, is what a fantastic camaraderie you'd be coming into. And that, that started uh, right at the beginning with Diony and, and, and Richard. Um, and I was aware of it when I was invited to join the committee quite early on and uh, Diane took one look at me and she said, you look like somebody who can get something done. We all need to have a proper role. You can do events. And uh, here we are. Can I introduce you to Diane and Richard, who will be talking about how Diane felt it was so important to have an all-world society and the barriers that together, and, and particularly Diane, um, overcame because there was surprisingly a lot of resistance and certain people ought to have known better in my opinion. Over to you Rick. Well good evening everybody it's nice to see so many people uh, here this evening or wherever it may be whatever time of day it may be with you. Um, I'm delighted to talk to Diane tonight and I'm going to ask a few simple questions to which she will give us hopefully quite long answers, um, really to kind of um, uh, establish how the Oral Society started in the first place. Um, so I suppose really the first question I, I need to ask you, really, and it's nice to see you by the way, um, is where do you actually fit into the, the, the narrative of the, the Blair stroke Orwell family? I am the first cousin of Jacintha Buddicombe, who was <clears throat> Eric Blair's very first um, uh, love affair when they were both teenagers. And she wrote a book uh, subsequently, a long, long time later after he died in 1974, called Eric and Us. And when she died, she left me the copyright of that book and also some money. So um, when her sister Guinea died and left me a bit more, I decided uh, to have a, a postscript put onto uh, Eric and us. And uh, this was suggested by Gordon Bowker because I'd written to him and said, please, could he review it if I brought it out um, as a self-publishing book? Uh, so he came down to see me and I'd written a whole lot of notes for him to explain uh, the things that Jacintha hadn't said. And um, he came rushing into the kitchen when I was busy getting him some lunch and said, yes, I will do um, a review for you, but only on condition that you uh, make these notes into a postscript for the book. And that's how Eric and us the postscript edition um, came um, onto bookshelves. Yes, one of the things, of course, that you did explain, which um, but my father never understood, uh, was why she rejected him when he went to Burma and he came back. And of course, he went to, immediately went up to Shropshire to go and see her, only to be rebuffed, and he never understood to almost to the day he died. And I wonder whether you might just like to uh, remind people of the, the circumstances of, of that uh, particular episode. Yes, I can, because I'm <clears throat> much more modern than my cousin Jacintha, who was a real Edwardian. Uh, what happened was that um, when he went to Burma, they'd had a bit of a tiff uh, because he'd got a bit amorous and she wasn't ready for that. So when he came back, he wanted to carry on where he'd left off. And uh, in the meantime, Jacintha, who was two years older than um, Eric, 
had finally met somebody that she felt that she could be herself with. And the result of that was that she got pregnant. And in those days, that was a terrible thing. So she had just had her baby um, when he came back. And she was in a nursing home, which turned out to be just down the road, the same road as um, Mal Chambers, where um, Eric's Aunt Nelly lived and where he went to after Tickleton. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, he, he, he I mean, to, to his dying day, of course, he never knew what had happened. There are, I think, actually a couple of uh, photographs in some of the books. One of uh, where she is walking down the street, having just um, released her baby oh, to yeah. her uncle and aunt. Oh, I'm glad you got that one because it's so expressive. She looks so uh, detached and unhappy and her her aunt and uncle who adopted um, Michael, who is a girl, um, were looking so happy. And a street photographer took this picture. And we Quite extraordinary, I think. Yes. Quite extraordinary, yes. Um, yes, it was a, a, a very sad affair, I think, in the end. Whether, she, whether they would have ever got together, who knows? I'm going to see the picture. That, that's the one that she, uh, my father would have seen had she gone down to uh, the sanatorium where he was. Um, that's how he would have seen her had she, had she gone to see him. Yes. But I, uh, she felt that um, because she had had to give up her own child, she couldn't bear um, the thought of being asked to look after anybody else's. Uh, do you think they would have... Now, here's an interesting question, Joni. Do you think uh, that had she... Do you think they could have got, could have got married? Had things well, gone the way uh, should have done? They could have, uh, but she was a lot more old-fashioned than he was, and she would have taken longer uh, to modernize herself and he would have gone whizzing off. It wouldn't have lasted, I don't think. No, okay. She, yes, I mean, he was, uh, yes, he was attracted to, to women who were quite strong. I mean, of course, she, being older, she, uh, she was quite well, I mean, she was very well read. And I think that's what they, they yes. kept them together when they were youngsters. Oh, she was very intelligent and, and uh, a poet right from a child. But she was about five foot nothing, you know, and and uh, even when he was eleven and she was thirteen, uh, uh, he was taller than her. <laughs> yes, yes, he he would have towered over her, wouldn't he? Had they yes. had it ever come to anything? Maybe it was just as well, perhaps, that uh, it fizzled out. I think you had a good mother in Eileen. I, I think so, and of course, um, my my father's equal. Yes which uh, I think we all agree with. So, Joni, we've kind of really, I think we've been sort of covered the introduction, as it were. Um, what made you want to start the Orville Society? Well, it was because when Jacintha died and she left me the copyright, she left a little note saying she did so hope that I might be able to get it back onto bookshelves again, because it was out of print by then. And so, because she'd been very kind to me, um, and when Guinea died, she was also very kind to me, I decided that I would put a large sum of money, half of what I had been left, uh, to promote this book. So I started off with a, a little website to promote it. And people kept um, contacting me on this little website, uh, saying, why isn't there a normal society? And after a while, um, there were so many of these that I decided to uh, stick my neck out. And um, I, I know it's a cynical thing to say, but um, if you pay enough to somebody for something, they will do anything. So I paid an enormous amount of money to 30 odd people uh, to write essays, and they were all the Orwellians. The first one being Bernard Crick, 
and Peter Davidson and Gordon and uh, everybody, everybody. Well, so that's that, that's, that was the, the, the genesis of yes. your thoughts of starting with the society. Yes, and, and that mm -hmm. gave us a grounding. Yes. Now, we're, we're talking here, of course, I suppose, about the beginning of, of uh, this, this new century, uh, 2000 plus. Um, you and I, I think, met, uh, I, I can't remember because I think uh, my diaries don't tell me, but I think we met about 2004, 2005. Yes, we did. Because and, I, I brought out Eric and us, and you, I had this very nice letter from somebody called Richard Blair saying, mm -hmm. I've, uh, congratulations on uh, publishing Eric and us. I am the son. Uh, may I be of any help to you? And I thought that was so nice. Uh, and you've been like that ever since, Richard. Oh, well, I'm, I'm flattered that you should tell me so, dear um, well, There were three of you. There was you, there was Peter Davidson, and there was Gordon Barker. And yes. in, America, in America, then there was Liam Hunt. And the mm -hmm. four of you were my total support. I used to try and interest people in the society and I'd take them out to lunch and they'd have a lovely lunch. And then they'd tell me that really, if, if I must insist on organizing anything, maybe I ought to go and organize another women's institute. Um, uh, various, uh, not very polite, comments like that and some of them were just dead rude uh, and said get back in your kitchen woman <laughs> well, well I'm very I'm very glad that uh, you persisted Joni and well, told me I'm, these... I'm in my kitchen now I've done as they <laughs> said <laughs> yes indeed but um, nevertheless I'm still glad you told them to uh, to, to, to go somewhere else uh, and and persist with it because um, you and I, I think we met uh, several times, I think, in London at the Orwell Awards. Well, that uh, when you were very good to me. You kept inviting me. You and Jean Seaton kept inviting me. And in that way, I got to know Bernard. I got to know Clive James, all sorts of interesting people who were interested in what I was saying. Mm -hmm, indeed. Um, I know that we it used to be at uh, Carlton Gardens uh, ter Terrace, wasn't yes. it, that uh, we had the, the Reform Club. Yes. Uh, which where the, um, Bernard would have his, his uh, awards evening. Yes. Um, they were always slightly chaotic, I remember, but nevertheless, they, they, they seemed to pass off all night. We've now, uh, to some extent, of course, we've now got to the point where the, 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 the thought of the Orbital Society has now lodged firmly in your mind and possibly other people's mind. That's I was right. going to ask the question, really, what obstacles did you face when you suggested that such a society should be formed? And, and from whom did you get, the, where did the ob obstacles come from? Oh, I'm not going to say any names, no. <laughs> but I, get, I got a great deal of opposition and a great deal of contempt and disdain. And it made me extremely cross and, and, and very determined. Uh, and uh, I just put my head down and kept going. Uh, and as more people wrote to, um, by that time, the website had become the oral um, essay and forum because the essays were going up and being promoted online for two months and then they would be archived where they could be read. And as I, we were getting this archive looking wonderful, people were longing to read them. Mm -hmm. uh, that gave them the interest in mm -hmm. the possibility of uh, a sati because I always said to them, what I want to do is to start a society because nobody else has done it. I said to one of the rude people who were so rude to me that uh, why were they saying this to me when they hadn't had um, the determination or commitment to or will to start a, a society themselves? Well, I suppose that they're, yes, I, I've been, some of the things that I was hearing was, well, why do you want a, an normal society? Yeah. 
uh, so, which seemed a bit odd at the time, but there we go. Uh, people said they wanted to meet, you see. Mm. It became essential. Uh, and because I didn't even live in London, London was at the centre, um, that was a terrible headache. So um, it has had to remain in, in the ether, which it is today. Well, indeed. So, we, we, I mean, we, we met several times during the, uh, from about sort of 2005, 2000 onwards. Then I got an invitation from you uh, that would I come down to Phyllis Court in Henley and to, for lunch, where you wanted to talk to various people about the possibility of setting up the Law Society. And yes. I think I came down, I think it was the day after, after Boxing Day, or was it Boxing Day? I can't remember now. It, it was the 20th, 27th of, of December, um, yes. 2010. And I, I managed to get seven or eight people together. Uh, and they agreed to come because that's a sort of dead time between Christmas and New Year. And really, I think their wives wanted to kick them out of the house anyway. So uh, they, they happily came and had a jolly good lunch. Uh, Phyllis Court was actually founded by my uncle. Uh, and so I thought how nice it would be if the Orwell Society were founded by his niece. <laughs> Well, and, and in, in, within the location of when they came back from India. So, um, yes, it was probably fortuitous. Yes. Um, I think, and I'm trying to remember now, it was very soon afterwards, and we had this sort of informal meeting, we had this lunch, and then I think you, we, we came back again at the beginning of the, the year, uh, where we had a sort of informal committee meeting, as it were. I mean, you, you, you have to start it somehow. How, yes. how do you start a society? Well, you start by talking. We did. And uh, we actually had some very good uh, thoughts exchange around that table, didn't we? And, and uh, it became so possible uh, that we decided to meet in April of 2011 and um, formally convene society and that's what yeah. we did. We did indeed so um, I mean one of my questions was here uh, I think we've kind of really covered it to some extent I mean how did you manage to overcome these these people who were so anti the thought of uh, uh, such a thing as a normal society? Well I just backed away from them quite a few of them actually rethought what they'd said and came back and and um, expressed interest. So I just remained very cool and let them get on with it. And if they wanted to become a member when we had convened, and if we could convene, well, good. Uh, and that's what happened with quite a few. I, well, I, I learned to, to be quite thick skinned at one point. <laughs> I, I, I think in, in many ways, Joni, you, you were fighting a, a, a single handed battle to some extent uh, because I certainly wasn't aware of some of the things that was, that was going on in the you know in the background. No. Um, I think, the I think they, these one. battles were won and then you told me and then we went on from there. Yes I think the, bat, the, the worst of it was that I wasn't mm. an academic, I didn't have a degree or anything like that because I married virtually straight out of school uh, and um, so I was obviously quite naive. Uh, but my word, I did learn in those four years of brick bats and bouquets, I learned, to, I did a bit of growing up, I think. <laughs> uh, well, I think you, you certainly learned very quickly. I suppose you know, some, you know, some academics can be um, quite hard work. I think, I, I hope I'm not treading on any toes here. Um, I and if I have, I, I apologise. <laughs> I hope you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, yes, we're getting into trouble here. Um, but anyway, I mean, we had this the meeting at Phyllis Court and uh, it went on, uh, progressed, and it progressed actually really quite quickly, didn't it? Yes. We, we, we established a committee and there we were, we've suddenly Wow, um, um, we've, we've become an old society. 
Yes, sir. Um, it was in April that we decided who should be who, and I yes. asked uh, Christopher to be our first chairman uh, and you to be our president. Um, and um, Chris Organ to be our legal man and Charles Wigan to be our treasurer. Yes. Um, Toby Crick uh, failed to, to come to the second meeting. I think he had um, family troubles, yeah. um, but he didn't come. I, I, seem to, I seem to remember that I think you shanghaied uh, for old Christopher Edwards into being chairman. I um, did. I think you straight you strong armed him. Yes, he wasn't expecting it at all. He had a look of shock on his face. <laughs> I, I remember it clearly. It's all believe? good. God. Well, he, he took it in good, uh, in good part because he was, uh, you know, he, he, he did well. Steady. He was such a steady person. Yes. And we had a, a very, uh, we had a jolly good first year in many ways, but we had one problem person who really could have uh, seen the whole society off. And Christopher sailed through this problem with no, <laughs> without raising a hair. And, and that's what we needed. Yes, indeed. We, we remember that episode, which is, you know, <laughs> it's passed by and uh, it's now history. Yes. Um, so really, we've, I mean, we've now established that, that the Orwell Society, we, we've got a committee going, of yes. which uh, you, you are part of, of course. And um, I think we met quite successfully from time to time. Uh, we established a, a, a pattern. Um, we, most of our, our uh, the first to begin with, of course, was in um, Reading. Yes. And, and uh, Charles Wiggin was a, an accountant and his offices were in Reading and he very kindly gave us um, a conference room every time we wanted to have a meeting. Uh, and I, I must uh, introduce you, uh, Richard, to the very last Buddicombe, my cousin Jenny, who I can see in front of me. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Well, that's... I guessed that you were... Well, <laughs> Hello Jennifer, how nice to meet, meet you, face to face as it were. I would I'd love, to, I'd love to actually talk to you. She's a very um, precious one day. <laughs> when, oh of course she's, she's, she's uh, muted. No, you, you, you can unmute yourself for this Jennifer, thank you. Have I done it? You have. Yes, yes, there you go. Right, yes. I'm not very good at Zoom, you see, it is, especially for this, I've made a great attempt as I'm famous for not managing to get there. Uh, no, but, well, one, one day we will, we will meet. Yes, face, indeed. Face, yes. face, well, face we have, to face. We have met, but without knowing who each other was, probably, at various meetings. Sort of, sort of like ship, ships in the night, as it were, <laughs> chatting to each other yes. without realising. Uh, yes, okay. but uh, various launches of things. Yes. For uh, I, I'm... Terrible at, at remembering names and faces. So, you know, I, 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 I kind of blame it on old age, I think. There we go. Um, but at, going back, Dione, I, I guess we, we've now, let's say we've now, we've now got uh, the, the society going. I suppose the last question I need to ask you is, are we going in the right direction? Well, I think we are because right at the very beginning, it was in my heart to try and get the society uh, stable enough and strong enough financially to be able to offer bursaries and a scholarship. Well, we haven't got as far as the scholarship yet, uh, but we have got as far as the bursaries and they are for teachers of uh, English uh, to teach along Orwell's line of thinking. Yeah, and I think what, what one of the things that we are quite keen on actually pursuing is um, closer cooperation, I hope, with the, with the foundation. For a long time, we were very keen not to tread on the foundation's toes. That's the Orwell Foundation, by the way, the Orwell Foundation and the Orwell Youth Prize, which, of course, uh, had started much uh, earlier. But um, since then, they have shown interest that we should be closer to them and 
we too would like to be closer to them in, in some way where we are sort of symbiotic, for the want of a better word. I'm particularly, uh, and I hope it will happen. I'm particularly pleased about that, Richard, because I got an awful lot of uh, humorous dismissal from that quarter for quite a while until I'd sort of proved myself, hadn't I? <laughs> yes, I, I think, to, to be honest, I think uh, that the Foundation are, because I attend their meetings, that the Foundation is uh, recognises us for what we are and that we are doing actually doing really quite a good job, I think, by and large. We could always improve, as the headmaster would say, but um, there is room for improvement. There is always room for improvement, is there not? But nevertheless, uh, I think we owe you a great uh, debt of gratitude for, for what you have done for us in getting this society going. Um, and you will be remembered forever as the lady who's, who founded the Orwell Society. Well, and the trouble you know, is, I'm so old, I was in my 70s, uh, well, I was 79, uh, that first lunch together at Phyllis Court, uh, and 80 by the time we convened, and I'm now 90, for God's sake, so we need lots of young people, um, like you lot, uh, certainly not like me. I retired when I was 85 because I thought that there shouldn't be an 85-year-old in any committee needed a younger person sitting. Well, I, don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> at 85, if you're, if you're still firing at all cylinders, what's I'm wrong with eight, that? I'm not 85, I'm 90. <laughs> <laughs> all right, 90 then. <laughs> if you're still firing on all cylinders, why not? No, you've... you've uh, um, you graciously stood aside and we, we've moved on since then, but uh, you've always taken a I mean, very, very close interest in the society. And uh, as I say, you'll, you will be remembered forever as being the lady. Your, your name will always be underneath the All Society logo. I thought you were going to say to be underneath yours. I thought my oh, <laughs> luck's <that's> changed. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you, you first, me, me second. <laughs> so I think, you know, we're, we're, we've kind of uh, covered most things. We've, we've covered the, the, the sort of story of um, how the society started. Uh, and I hope people have got a sort of a little flavour of uh, what, we've, what we've achieved. And um, I would, all I can say, Leonie, is thank you very, very much indeed for talking to us tonight. Uh, it's been a pleasure listening to you and uh, hopefully we will see you from de temps en temps uh, at various, uh, at the uh, AGMs, if not at other occasions. Yes, I'm sure everybody has enjoyed that as much as I have and uh, I've obviously been closer to it than some of you. Um, I, uh, Christopher, uh, who Diony said she strong-armed into becoming chairman. One of the things that uh, she did to get him to recognise that was to give the give him the gavel for organising our meetings. So we always start and finish our meetings with this gavel that that Diony has donated. So when we come to the end, you'll hear me go, and that will be after for the last question, especially for tonight only. Um, who would like to ask the first question? Les, uh, unmute yourself, please. Peter. Uh, uh, Peter Stansky. Um, oh, Peter. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 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 did you call on me? That, that oh, was, please, Peter, yes. And of course, uh, the, the collection of poems that uh, the only did was so wonderful. But I wonder, <clears throat> could, could uh, why was there so much opposition to founding the society? I mean, there's so many authors support societies. I would have thought it would have been routine to, uh, to, ha to have an author support society. Why, why was there so much opposition? Well, I think, the I, think for the opposition? I think it was because uh, they agreed that there ought to be a, a, an oral society, but they disagreed that I should have anything to do with it because I was a, a, I knew nothing about anything. Um, so the answer to that was to say to them, well, I'm disappointed that you haven't taken the chance to do it yourself, which I said several times. And I think that was a, 
the least polite I was. <laughs> but it's lovely to see you, Peter, because you have been a great source of, of support and joy too. Oh, he's... Thank you so much. That's very nice of you to say. And, and, and as you members of the society know, and, and I think it's available to them, we are, on December 3rd, Chris Angel, who I see is here, uh, and John Roden and Rebecca Solnit and uh, Alex Wallach, we had a round table on Orwell, uh, which I think uh, by, uh, I think Christopher has sent it to Quentin. Yes, it's been circulated. Uh, so if any members of the society wish to watch it, uh, they can. Who, who would like to ask the next question? Les. Thank you, Quentin. Richard, Richard Keeble, I've noted you, you want to ask a question. Les. Um, th thank you. Um, if I can just say that the, the, the large amounts of money that Diane paid for essays in the early days, which appeared on the Finlay Publishers website, are now available and have been available on the Orwell Society website, um, if you search for them. In some of them, there, there will be a, the, the, the word Findlay will appear, indicating that that was the original place. Um, one of Liam Hunt's contributions had disappeared, but we hunted him down and he gave us a copy of that again. So that I think the, uh, the society has a complete copy of every essay which appeared on the Findlay Publishers website for anyone who's interested in it. Um, I did follow up uh, with an essay on uh, Jacintha's friends in the, um, in the Henley and Shiplake area because she knew the Ardizone family of, of yes. artists, yes. Um, which also extended to Christiana Brand, the, the crime writer. Yes. And Dionne was good enough to give me uh, her memories of life during the Second World War in, in the village where she knew Arthur Ransom who uh, she has said was a great uh, uh, friend to her at the time. He started um, by writing off. He, he that's, yeah, so yeah. your little memoir is, is on the website too. Yes. Thank you for that. So uh, it's a point to make, I'm, I'm afraid. It's not a question, but thank you very much, Dionne, for your continuing contributions. And we've tried to keep them live as a, along with everything that you, you'd organized for the Finlay Publishers website. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Keeble, please. Yes, Diney. Hello. Um, hi. Um, I think uh, you're very self-critical, but I think you've made a, a vast contribution to the knowledge of Orwell, the study of Orwell, your collection of poems really transformed, I think, our understanding of the man up until then, um, his being a poet and his interest in poetry was very marginalized, if ever really seriously considered. So I think you deserve a lot for having produced that edited collection and deserve very much uh, the, the great sales of that book. Your other book um, is actually one of my favourite books in the whole of the Orwellian canon. I'm always terribly moved by it, and I'm moved by your postscript in particular, because whilst the knowledge of Orwell's childhood is relatively limited, he didn't go into it in great deal, obviously there's such, such for the joys, etc. Jacintha's memoir is extremely important, but your postscript confronted this great event in their relationship, which in effect uh, destroyed it. Um, and you are extremely clear and honest about precisely what happened. I think it was the first time this really became known. People have picked it up since. And the question is, when you were going into that event, which was incredibly, um, well, it transformed their relationship. Um, 
did you think that people who were very critical of Orwell could have picked up on it? It didn't reflect him in the best possible ways. In fact, it reflected on him, one could say, very badly. What was your thoughts as you were going through that postscript? I considered him as he was, and that was a, a teenager. And teenagers in those days were even more naive and clumsy uh, than they are now. Uh, and because there was less experience in teenage with sexual uh, attentions. And uh, I hope I uh, emphasized in the postscript that he had got overexcited and had to be um, told to, shouted to stop. And he did stop. And he felt very bad about it. But he obviously had gone a step further than Jacintha wanted. And, and I have only got this from um, her sister Guinea, who sat and talked to me about it one day because she was remembering um, Jacintha's face when she came home. Very frightened, sad little face. If, if I could just add to the point that uh, Richard made about uh, the, the contribution you've made to the study of, of Orwell Dione is, is that you've been an enormous catalyst. One of the things that's uh, very clear is that academics on their own patch are, are judged by their own work and they have to stand on their own feet and all the rest of it and being cooperative is uh, not necessarily part of the, the game. But what we've seen increasingly in these last few years is that members doing research, academics and others doing research, are increasingly talking to each other and between them are creating quite a, 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 a new body of work that wouldn't have happened but for you. Good. <laughs> Uh, makes me feel very humble when you say that because... Well, no, it's true, though. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely true. Rick? Yes. Uh, just coming back to the, the little book of poems, uh, just a sort of a, a anecdote. I, I use two poems from there. If I, I hadn't done a talk uh, in front of people for a long time now, must be over a year, but I, I do illustrate the, the, the poems that I've that my father wrote. One, of course, is for to introduce a bit of humour, is romance, yes. about his, <laughs> which I think is very funny. It uh, is. And, the other, and I always finish my talks with the Italian soldier. Yes. Which is for those of you who have read uh, Dione's little book on the explanation of, of Orwell's poems, which was very, very thorough and uh, very far-reaching. It's, it's well worth, for, for those of you who haven't read them, please do, because it's... Uh, <laughs> there it is. There, there we are. Uh, please do, because it's, um, it's an insight into Orwell, because he, he, was, he was all things... He, I don't think he would ever have considered himself to be a poet, but he could write poetry. Yes. And he could write poetry in different styles. Um, but nevertheless, he realised that he was actually uh, a, a wordsmith, not a poet. We but but those, those, two poets were, those two poems are, uh, I, I love them dearly. Good. The, the poetry can be bought from our website using the uh, uh, Well Stores, I think we call it now, don't we? All royalties going to the society, not to me. Who would like to ask a question? Michael King. Thanks, Quentin. Um, very interesting talk from you both there. Thank you very much indeed. And Dione, particularly, I think you were my first contact with the Orwell Society when I joined it. I don't know how many years ago now. Um, a comment and a quick question. First of all, I'd like to add that he was also a very um, astute critic of poetry. His pieces about the four, Eliot's Four Quartets, 
his piece about Manly Hopkins and others as well. Um, so apart from being a you know an interesting poet, I think he was quite a quite a decisive critic of poetry. Um, a little bit, I'm just intrigued a little bit about um, the relationship that Jacinta had. First of all, why did she not stay with that person? And you say it was a it was a daughter that your aunt and uncle brought up. Is that person still alive? If not, have they got relatives who are interested in the society? Um, no. Uh, uh, Michael, the daughter, became a doctor and she married a doctor and they went to Canada and there are seven cho of her children there. She has died, mm. but she, there are seven uh, uh, of Jacintha's grandchildren there. They don't take an interest in, in Orwell at all or the society? Well, they do, but they <clears> don't <throat> go any further. They're very interested and two of them in particular follow everything, but I think oh. they feel they're too far away. Mm, mm, that's nice to hear anyway. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Who would like to ask a question? Norman? Yes, Norrie, please. Yes, I was uh, writing a chat to comment, but uh, as a relatively new member, I'd like to thank Dion, Richard and the other founders of the Society. Um, it really is a wonderful resource for anyone who wants to learn anything at all about, about um, George Orwell. And uh, as, as Quentin has said, uh, I think the first time I met members was at the 20, uh, 2018 visit to Barnhill. And uh, I, found, I found it was a very warm welcome I received. So, but my question is, apart from scholarships, what else would Dion and Richard like to see the society doing in the future, especially to encourage the knowledge of Orwell in, the, in school curricula, in, um, not just in, in the UK, but in worldwide? Is there anything that you have on that? that? So you want me to answer that? Yes, because you are, I'm not on the committee anymore, but look at, uh, we've got Anne and all sorts of people. Well, absolutely. Um, yes, within the society, Laurie, and good evening to you, by the way, and um, <laughs> how is Ling? <laughs> Ling's doing very well. No COVID <laughs> cases whatsoever. <laughs> Um, no, to try and answer your question, um, yes, we are very, very much aware of trying to get uh, get into good schools, of which uh, Anne Kronberg, our, our trustee, is uh, doing an excellent job. Um, we are trying to sort of work alongside the foundation, who have, of course, got a, 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 a grip of uh, the schools in their Orwell Youth Prize. So we're trying to, uh, to, to ease in with, not ease in with them, but, but to work alongside them um, in parallel. And um, I'm sure that we, there are things that we can do that we will, will come up in, in the future. Um, it will all get hopefully better and better, but it's at, um, we're still working on it at the moment. And I think, um, it's, it's trying to, you know, get around to talking to schools and um, it's just, I'm quite happy to travel around the countryside, but of course it's not easy for some other of the uh, uh, committee uh, members to, to be able to do. Well, it, one, of the, um, one of the things that we, we are uh, finalising at the moment is a, a school's membership as opposed to individual memberships and um, but I mean, we 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 see growing the society about uh, principally about uh, in many ways about about outreach to people who can live those values and spread them and clearly schools are very important most most of us if we did a straw poll tonight started reading all well when we were in our teens um, and you know we obviously wish to encourage that the other thing is encouraging uh, journalists who 
would subscribe to those values rather than mm. Murdoch's. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, any any plans for the universities or the colleges where we? Um... Well, we're, 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 we're again, we we we've we've uh, tried hard with the universities to get them to support our bursaries. It has been a very uphill battle, and uh, and working with. Diony's son Guy uh, have been working during this autumn on a, a new strategy, a new way of getting access to the the, the interest of these people. And it's a substantial uh, bursary, and we we got we well with the teaching one before and redevelop the scheme we're running now, we had not a single applicant, and we don't understand why, so we're trying a different way. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, anybody else would like to ask a question? I can't see everybody. Yeah. Gwen? Uh, yes, uh, Dennis. Hello, Di Danny. This Hello. is Dennis. I, you look just as young as when I took you around Glasgow a few years ago. <laughs> yes, I remember. <laughs> and I've still, got, I've still got the badge you pinned onto this jacket in in the borough i've still got the, the the badge there and it's great to see you and we had it well as you know as you, we had a great time in glasgow and and you might even manage to get back up here that would be great hope so thank you uh, uh -uh. Masha, would you like to ask a question <laughs> yes hi diary yes can you hear me <laughs> hi it's great to oh. see you <laughs> I'm in Canada, but luckily I can tune in. Uh, lovely to see you. Lovely. I, I couldn't get the audio to work for most of the meeting. Did you mention that uh, Jacinta and Orwell got in touch with each other just before he died? Uh, I found that very intriguing when yeah. I discovered that. Well, that was the time when he asked, um, suggested in a letter that she might consider uh, looking after his baby son and yes. she, she backed away from that because she'd had to uh, give up her own child and couldn't bear the thought of being asked to look after somebody else's. But that they were going to meet, they did plan to meet if he had been able to get out of the hospital. Yes, so I, I fantasized that they might actually get together with little Richard. Well by the oh. time uh, Jacintha decided she would like to go and see him he'd moved to London and had just popped the question to Sonia oh. <laughs> or rather Sonia. We got to call her Sonia according to Sonia. Um, Ian Angus. Okay. <laughs> anyway, lovely to see you. And you oh. too. Well, for, for, for those who don't know Sylvia, Sylvia's uh, biography of uh, Eileen is being issued in paperback I think in March isn't it Sylvia? That's what they say yes. Yeah and Syl Sylvia and and, uh, and I will be in conversation in a similar way uh, in March about the way she pursued her research just as doggedly in, in her way as Diony did to create the society. Um, we have time for one last question and then happens. <laughs> oh, well, I think that's uh, uh, Guy. Oh, I see, I see a hand. Um, yeah, Mike, would you like to ask your question? Uh, I'm unmuted. No, it's, it's more of an observation as um, um, from from the first day, I'm, I'm, I'm founder member and the guy who's the son of, uh, of Danny. Um, I think what happened at, uh, at the beginning with the Orwell Direct was um, uh, was really uh, about academic exchange, about getting um, people like Bernard Crick and and um, uh, and people with real presence uh, in academic circles to have conversations through a virtual medium like we are today 
starting off in, in a virtual sense as, uh, uh, as, as it did through All, All World Direct. And, and obviously with such um, gravitas going on uh, on this website, uh, there were bound to be questions about, well, who is this woman? What does she mean to us? But I think what hasn't come across quite yet, but I think the link to what we have today is that eventually they realized that she wasn't a threat to them. And in not being a threat, it was like, okay, well, maybe we can have more of a dialogue, more of a conversation. And I think the whole ethos of the Orwell Society is about a colloquial, friendly environment where you can exchange um, presence, whether you have gravitas in, um, uh, in your uh, academic background and your understanding of George Orwell, or if you're just passionate about him because of a personal experience that he managed to evoke in you and change your, um, your own personal direction. Because it, it then becomes a personal story as well as a story of academic uh, significance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the society allows us to make that connection between what really evokes Orwell in ourselves personally and what's of interest to academia. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very rare to have that uh, connection between the two. And having someone like um, Dani, who is completely ignorant in, in matters of George Orwell, or was, Thank you. Uh, made it, <laughs> made it <laughs> incredible. Made Under it, the mouths of babes and sucklings. Yes, <laughs> but made it credible uh, because she didn't have an agenda and she wasn't a threat. <laughs> Leave the <No>. one guy. <laughs> Would you agree with that, um, Dani? <laughs> I think that's probably an astute observation, Guy. I think Rick would like to say something and then we will... Well, I, I, actually, I think uh, um, Ziggy wanted to say a few words. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Ziggy, oh, I, okay, yeah. I, I had to swap my computer twice during this talk. Thank you, Dione. It's been such an interesting, um, interesting yes, evening and, and listening to your... Um, contribution to, to setting up the society. Getting back to the key issue of Jacinta though, and picking up on what Sylvia asked, um, that very important moment at the end of Orwell's life, when he wrote, I think, one of his most moving letters actually to her. And yes. I can't, I don't have it in front of me and I, I should be able to quote it. But in it, he says, in, in that wonderful way in which he can express something, he, he expresses in a sentence um, his, his memory of Jacinta and the wonderful days that they shared together. And I feel that there is that, the essence of their connection continued right to the end of both of, well, his life and I guess hers as well. And that that's what was important. Um, in that connection and in the memoir that she wrote. Um, and the one thing that I'm, I'm sort of mystified about is what she actually felt when she uh, went to the funeral at the end of his life and she was seen, I think, I believe, that she melted into tears there as one would, would have felt. But what, you know, what did she feel, did she feel she had lost um, the essence of that connection with the young man or with the writer that she'd never really known when he was successful? Sorry, a bundled question, but... Yes, well, yeah. it's all right. I, I can answer that quite quickly, actually, because um, she had grown up. Uh, so the Jacintha and, and Eric uh, of their young days were not uh, the George and Jacintha uh, when it came to the end of his life. And I, I think that they would have both very quickly realized that, uh, but b become very interested in each other on uh, an, an artistic level. Um, because he didn't realize what a good poet she'd become. She was a poet for 30 something years. Um, and there were those things to discover which they never did. Yeah. So, um, really, uh, when he died, it was the right moment uh, for Jacintha, who then, she never married anybody else because nobody came up to Eric's standard of intellectualism. 
So uh, that's why she continued to talk about him for the rest of her life. Yes. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. A good answer to a very bad question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think that's a very, very uh, suitable point at which to uh, ask you all to unmute yourselves because I'm sure, like me, you've uh, found this evening fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>